Hey, everybody. I'm an addict named Barry. Hi, Barry. Uh, I'm thrilled to be sitting in front of you guys tonight. Um, it's been a long day. Uh, we did a lot today. We got a lot done. We had a lot of running around to do, but we did it. And uh, I tried taking a little nap so I'd be awake and uh, it didn't go very well, but it doesn't matter. I'm here and I'll, I'll do my best and that's all that matters. And it's not like I'm getting graded anyway, but I like to know I give my best because this program has given me the, its best. So I believe it's only reciprocal that what I get, I try to give back. And um, I, I, if, if I were to pick a topic, it would be out of the basic text the chapter, What Can I Do? Because it talks about everything. It talks about uh, everything from coming in as a newcomer, getting a sponsor, the importance of sponsorship, the importance of working the steps, the importance of going to meetings, the importance of developing a relationship with something to believe in. Um, it talks about the fellowship. It talks about the program. It talks about everything that there is to talk about in Narcotics Anonymous and everything that is necessary to me for uh, a satisfactory recovery or a complete recovery. Um, and it talks about the, the disease of addiction and it, and it specifies that we have a disease that we're sick people, um, not bad people. And it talks about how the steps apply in our lives and what it can do for us by following these 12 simple steps, Narcotics Anonymous. They're, um, they're written in an order, um, and it suggests that we do them with a sponsor. It suggested that we do them with sincerity and a clear mind and a clear heart, and we give it our best effort. We're told early on in the steps that we can often write too little, but we can never write too much. And there comes a time when it, it's just like it becomes put up or shut up. You know, like I believe that recovery is a three-part process. We get clean, we stay clean, and then we live clean. At least that's the way it is. it was for me. Um, I didn't come in here and live clean automatically. I did step work, but I still didn't live clean. Uh, I, it was hard for me and still is sometimes hard for me to let go my old ways of thinking, my old ways of behavior, just my old ways of being, ways that have served me for years and years and years in ways that I believe are positive, but now they, they have become defective in nature and I no longer need them because they, I've been given a new way to live. And, and I believe that the way, the only way we stay here is adapting or adopting this new way of life and letting go of our old ways. Like it was told to me, think of a, a satchel full of stones that I'm dragging around everywhere I go. And what I'm dragging around is my old ideas, my old thoughts, and my old ways of life. And they just don't fit here. You know, um, I came to Narcotics Anonymous for the first time in 1983 and I looked at this 12 steps on the wall and I just thought, man, there's no way, there's no way that this could possibly work. I've been to the finest psychiatrists and I've been to prison and I've had psychologists talk to me and, and social workers talk to me and doctors reckon with me and they sent me to prison, they sent me to uh, nut houses and there's no way that the, this gobbledygook on the wall is going to do anything. And at that time, I had never seen an addict get clean or stay clean and thought it was just an impossibility. And, and, you know, I looked at the steps and it said, you know, in the first step, talked about being powerless over our addiction and our lives have become unmanageable. And the second step, coming to believe in a power greater than ourselves. Well, I didn't have a power greater than myself. I didn't want a power greater than myself. I was an angry, angry guy. I was a hateful guy. I didn't like you and I didn't like me and I didn't want to be friends with you and I didn't want to know you and I didn't want to come to a church basement every night for the rest of my life. So I just kind of looked around and said, see you guys later, man. You're not for me.
and, and I went out and, and used for a few more years and, and I came back in 85 and I still wasn't convinced, but I, I was, my ass was kicked a little bit more and, and I decided, you know, what, what do I have to lose by giving this a shot? And I really couldn't understand a whole lot. Um, I came out of the treatment center and I was told by my aftercare counselor that I was what they would call chronic and habitual. And she, you know, she told me I was a heroin addict. She didn't tell me I was just an addict. She said I was a heroin addict. And then because of that, my chances of recovery were basically slim and none. I was 36 years old. I had never been off parole or probation since the time I was 16. And, you know, she told me the outlook for me was bleak. And that I was probably going to continue to suffer unless I grabbed in and, and grab this way of life and, and hung on to it for dear life. And, and I wasn't convinced still that this worked, but I, I said, you know what, I'm gonna give it a whirl. And what had happened was I had taken a bus up to uh, a place called White Deer Run. It's not, not an endorsement, it's just the name of where I went. And they told me uh, when I got sent up there, I was kicked off of a methadone clinic that I had been on for 14 years. And they told me that I would be um, detoxed with methadone. They told me that they had horseback riding up there and they had tennis courts and swimming pools. And, and I really didn't give a shit about swimming pools and tennis courts. That wasn't my thing. Shooting dope was. Um, you know, I wasn't the, the Ivy League set from the tennis courts or the horseback school of riding. Um, but when they told me that I, they wouldn't give methadone, they didn't do that. And that pissed me off because I was told that I was and I was just lied to to get me up there so that they could find a way to get me into treatment. And um, what happened was uh, I, the day before, they, they came down to Philly to pick me up and I had bought a couple extra doses of methadone, a handful of Valiums and and was wasted when I got up there and I kind of just fell out and I woke up the next morning to an announcement that said, <clears throat> attention community, morning med is now. So I shuffled down to the nurse's station. I said, I'm here for my methadone. And they said, oh, we don't give that here. And I said, well, you just announced it, morning med is now. And they said, that's morning meditation, not morning medication. And if I would have had somebody to accept a collect call or if I had somebody that would have come and picked me up, I would have left. You know, I didn't like that I was lied to. It didn't matter that I had lied to everybody in my life about everything. And, you know, I guess it's a good time to go back to tell you a little bit about me as a kid. Um, I was a troubled kid. Um, everybody seemed to like me, but I never liked myself. And I didn't like other people. Um, I hated you because I hated me. I was dishonest, I was a liar, I was a thief. I would steal something at the drop of a hat. I needed no provocation. If it wasn't mine, I would take it. Um, I had problems that are addiction problems way before I ever used the drug. Um, in the second grade, I got caught stealing baseball cards in the drugstore and got turned over to the police. Um, in the 10th grade, on our way home from summer school, we robbed an ice cream truck. And that was another confrontation with the Maryland State Police. I was, I was 14 years old. Um, and it just got worse, and it just got worse, and it just got worse. By the time I was uh, 16, my father was um, helping me clean my car. And we found some weed in a pipe, and he just looked at me, and he said, Barry, when are you going to grow up? And I shook my head and laughed, you know, and said, I'm having a great life. And at 18 years old, he found a set of works in my car. And he said, Barry, when are you going to grow up? And I laughed. I thought it was funny. And at 20, on my way to prison, my mother and father said, Barry, when are you going to grow up? And I laughed. I thought it was funny. And this continued. And at 35, my mother said to me, Barry, when are you going to grow up? And at 35, it wasn't so funny anymore. It was sad. And I knew it was sad. I just didn't know there was a way out. And it was funny. My dad died right about then, but he had a joke that he used to tell all his friends. He would say, my son Barry is like a magician. Everything he touches turns to shit. 
and that's the way I live my life. Um, when I use, you might as well put a uh, for sale sign out in front of my house, yard sale, everything must go cheap. Um, I lost everything, everything that I never gained. Addiction took from me everything that I never uh, could have. We used to always have a debate, what's worse? What was worse? What addiction took from me and what addiction never allowed me to have. And between the two of them, it was everything. Um, I never saw an, another addict <clears throat> recover from this disease. I didn't know it was possible. I saw my friends go to Second Genesis. I saw them go to Synanon. I saw them go to the federal drug farm in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, but I never saw anyone recover. I saw them go to these places. And after six months, they earned the right to drink alcohol. And in six months and two weeks, they were shooting up again. We were doing their drug of choice, whatever that may be. And nobody could understand why that was happening. And today, through the Narcotics Anonymous Program of Recovery, we understand that alcohol is a drink. I mean, it's a drug. And that we can't give an addict the privilege to use a mood or mind-altering substance because it just doesn't work for people like us. And we are so fortunate. We're the first generation, really the first generation in the history of the world that has a proven, proven track record of success to recover from the disease of addiction. The spirit of unity, the spirit of recovery, the spirit of goodness, the spirit of love, the spirit of fellowship, the spirit of hope, um, willingness, honesty, they're all the principles that are given to us to live to deal with this disease that we have. So here I was, I came out of this treatment center and I was told that I was going to be chronic and habitual and that really I wasn't going to recover. And I just kind of shook my head and said, whoa, whoa, I don't know. So apparently somebody spent a lot of money to get me educated or to get me here and try to get me better. Maybe I should listen. Maybe they know what they're talking about. And the same aftercare counselor, she told me, she said, Barry, I want you to go to five AA meetings a week because you're that's where the long-term recovery is. And I want you to go to two NA meetings a week because you're an addict. And, and it didn't make any sense to me, but once again, I figured somebody spent a lot of money to, to get me help. They know more than I know, maybe I'll give it a whirl. And the last thing she said on the way out the door was she said, I want you to get a sponsor with at least 10 years clean. And that just wasn't happening. And this was 1985 in Southern New Jersey. And the only person I knew, or I didn't even know, but I knew of, was Dutch and Blaze. And, you know, they weren't on my radar. Um, but anyway, I, I wanted to be clean more than I wanted to be high. And I went to a meeting and I stuck my hand up and I said, my name is Barry and I'm just out of a treatment center and I need help because I don't know how to stay clean. And a lot of the information I got didn't make any sense to me. And a guy named Jack Clark, who was at that meeting said, come on, after the meeting, come to the diner with us. And I, and I went to the diner, and the only reason I went was because I was scared if I didn't, get, if I didn't go to the diner, I was going to use. And they said, the waitress came around, and she, and she said, what do I want? And I, I had about 85 cents in my pocket. I said, I'm good. And this dude, Jack, said, no, nah, man, get what you want, man. So I looked at the menu, and the cheapest thing on the menu was an order of French fries. I said, give me an order of French fries. And we get around to him and he told the waitress, he said, give that dude a, a cheeseburger deluxe with French fries and coleslaw and a soda. And I'm like, Jack, why, why are you doing this? Um, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I can't pay you back. And he goes, don't worry about it, man. Someday when you're in a position, and I, I heard in the position, I'm like, is he gay? Does he want something from me? What's the, what's the deal here? Um, and I didn't know, you know, like the people, I wasn't used to people just doing something for me for the sake of doing it. And I said, well, what do I have to do for this? And he said, when you can, you do it for the next guy. And I've done it for a hundred next guys since then. But anyway, um, this was 1985. I stayed and I really got into the steps and, and I got a sponsor and I got a home group and I got into service and I got into H&I. 
I did prisons, I did treatment centers, I started sponsoring people, I started doing all the things that, that uh, we do here in, in Narcotics Anonymous. The only thing I didn't do was change my whole behaviors. And I got a job um, and it, like 60 days clean and, and I still, I didn't like the fact that I was a blue collar worker. It was a decent job, a blue collar job. It paid decent, but I, I realized I'd never have everything I wanted with that kind of a job. And I wasn't ambitious enough to try to improve my, my standings in life or get a better job or get an education or get a career or a trade. So I just started stealing from work. And I did it for 10 years. And um, it, it, what happened, it, it like 10 years clean, the perfect storm hit. I got injured on my job and I needed neck surgery, which meant medication. Um, I, I found out my wife, who I had met uh, and married in, in recovery, um, I found out that she was having an affair. And I asked her if she would stop seeing the guy, and she said she didn't want to. And then it, a little while later, I lost my job for stealing. So here I was in the midst of all this turmoil. And in all of that time, um, some wonderful things had happened to me. We had had three children. Um, we had a beautiful home. Um, I thought I had a beautiful life. I, I just, it just, you know, we, we had two separate lives, I guess. You know, and I'm not going to blame it all on her. She did the best she could for as long as she could. And it just didn't work out. You know, just it had to have a terrible ending. Um, but it, it ended... And um, anyway, I, I, after some more clean time and, and being re-injured again and neck surgery again, um, I used. And <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about is how hard it was to come back. I had 12 and a half years clean. I had spoken at two world conventions. I sponsored a bunch of people. I had been the opening speaker for the New Jersey Regional Convention. I've been flown out to Texas to speak. I've been flown out to San Diego to speak. Um, I had been uh, taken up to Canada to speak. And I thought that I wouldn't have to listen to everybody. I wanted to listen to who I wanted to listen to. This is all coming back. You know, a guy, a poor guy with like four days clean would come up to give me a hug and tell me I was in the right place. And in my head, I'd say, fuck you, dude. When you have... 10 years clean, then you can tell me what to do. Or I didn't want to take, you know, I still thought Narcotics Anonymous was like a union shop. The, the, the people at the front of the bus were the people with the most seniority and the most clean time, and he who had the most clean time rule. And that's how the story of my thinking had become because I was so out of touch with reality, and that's what led me to use it. And it was so hard to come back I remember being at a, at a clean time countdown and people that, that I had gotten clean way, way, way before would stand up for two years, five years, whatever, and I'd say to myself, oh, that asshole. You know, I was, I was so angry and so miserable and so down on myself. You see, because up to that point in time, I was successful at absolutely nothing in my whole life. And in staying clean for 12 and a half years in Narcotics Anonymous, I found success. And it was the most success I had ever had. And I couldn't deal with losing it. I just couldn't deal with it. And it, it devastated me internally. It took all my self-acceptance, all my self-worth. all my. It made me self-loathing. Um, it made me self-hate myself. It took all the goodness that I had developed in 12 and a half years of recovery and, and took it away. And, and I blame it all on my inability or lack of willingness to change my old ways of thinking. And it took 18 months to reestablish a new clean date. And the only way I did it, what happened was I had a sponsor, his name was Father Frank. And, and he was a Jersey dude. And, um, he, he came to me one day and he said, listen, Barry, you're going to have to get a new sponsor because you've been dicking around for 18 months and I'm not going to sit around and watch you die. And I said, Frank, you can't do that to me. And he said, watch me. And I said, Frank, if you 
continue to sponsor me, I will do anything you say. And he said, anything? I said, Frank, I swear I'll do anything. So he said, let me talk to my sponsor. And his sponsor was a guy named Dutch. And Dutch told him something and Frank called me back the next day and said, Barry, are you willing to do anything? And I said, Frank, I'll do anything. And he said, all right, pack your bags. You're going to a long-term treatment center in Southern California for relapsers. And I looked at him and I said, Frank, I can't do that, man. And he said, Barry, you said you'd do anything. And I said, Frank, who's going to take care of my kids? What about my mortgage? What about my car? What about my job? And Frank just looked at me and he said, Barry, you got arrested twice in two weeks. Do you think you're going to keep your car? Do you think you're going to keep your house? Do you think your kids are going to want to see, want to see you? You're going to lose everything and you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. And I said, all right, Frank, I'll go. When, when do I have to go? And he looked at me and he said, Barry, you don't have to go. We just wanted to see if you were willing. And he said, but what you have to do is you have to go to a meeting a day for 90 days. And that was one thing in that year and a half that I refused to do. You know, and he said, and I want you to come to my home group every Thursday night. And his home group was in a place called Vincent Town, New Jersey. And it was an hour and a half meeting. And he used to open the door at 45 minutes before the meeting. So he was at the meeting at 7.45 and the meeting was 8.30 to 10 and he was the last one out at like 10.30. So it was a long friggin' meeting. And I said, Frank, I can walk to a meeting in Medford in 10 minutes, it's from seven to eight, and you're talking about a whole ordeal that's four hours long. And he looked at me and he said, Barry, take it or leave it. And I said, I'll take it. And what happened was, on that, the first meeting, the first day of that meeting was on Thursday night, and it was in Vincent Town, New Jersey. It was September 6, 1999. That's my new clean date. The day that I surrendered, to really surrender to the Narcotics Anonymous way of life, the way that I surrendered to the spiritual aspects of sponsorship, the way I listened and took direction and had the spirit of love and the spirit of faith and the spirit of hope. And I practiced all these principles is my new clean day. And I don't think if I hadn't, if I hadn't done that, I doubt I'd be clean. I might be dead or back in prison. And what happened was on the day that would have been my 13th anniversary clean time, which was in May 19th, which yesterday, it was yesterday, and every, every May 19th, I mourned my old clean day. Because I, if I hadn't used that, I had 30, I'd have been 36 years clean. But I can say, honestly, I don't know about the 36 years clean. That was a maybe when I got 21 years in narcotics and violence recovery. And um, so what happened was, um, I thought it started to follow direction. And I found out that in the second step, it talks about a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And it doesn't say anything about a God. It just says a power greater than ourselves. And that power greater than ourselves is, is the, is the, the principle of sponsorship. The power greater than ourselves is the spiritual principle of love. And the power greater than ourselves is our literature. And the power greater than ourselves is the love of the fellowship. And the power greater than ourselves is a, is a loving, loving spirit that comes into us as a result of these 12 steps, having had that spiritual awakening. And, and what, what happened was in, in the 80s, I aspired to be a stepologist, really. I wanted to be the NA poster child. I wanted to be the guy that people said, man, did you hear him share? He was so profound. I want to be like him. You know, and I was so full of ego that I couldn't possibly have time to recover. Um, I was the guy that sat in the back of the room when you came in if you were lucky, I'd, I'd let you kiss the Godfather ring. 
you know, and I thought that I had all the answers for everybody. I would always be the last one called on in every meeting, and I'd clean up, try to clean up what everybody else said that was wrong. And I know you guys know what I'm talking about because I'm sure you got one in your area. Every area's got one of them guys or girls. <laughs> you know, they're just part of NA. Um, but um, I changed, you know, and all the people that had known me over the years said, I like the new Barry G better. You know, I found humility. You know, and it's not that I think less of myself, I think of myself less. And I think of others more. And I allowed a loving God into my life. And I went back and I attacked the steps like my life depended on it because it did. And, and I attacked the steps every day because my life depends upon it. And I live the best I can. You know, like um, my sponsor, uh, I ended up having Dutch as a sponsor, and he passed away with 48 years clean about seven months ago. And I, and I got to spend a lot of time with him. I spent the last couple of weeks of his life with him. His, his wife let me come and hang out there and help her with him. And I learned a lot from him. And he was a great teacher, and he didn't have to say a word. All I had to do was watch the way he lived. And I watched how he treated other people. And I watched how he conducted himself in relationships. And he was a kind, loving guy who practiced goodness and kindness. And he always used to say, the essence of the 12 steps are to love people where they're at, not where I want them to be. And if, and, and if somebody comes into your life, there's a reason for it. And we don't pick and choose who we help. We help anybody who, who asks for it. And we help everybody who needs it and everybody who wants it. And, you know, and I, I remember going to him right before he died. We went to a convention in Nebraska. And he, was, he, was, he yelled at me. He made me cry in the hallway because I was talking on the phone. And he turned around and he said, listen, you want to talk on the fucking phone? Go outside and go back up to the room. He goes, when you're with me, you're with me. He goes, put the fucking phone away. And, and it really upset me. And, and one of my sponsor brothers who was with me said, Dutch, don't you think that's being a little cold and cruel? And Dutch said, hey, listen, man, the dude asked me to sponsor him. Um, I don't know how much time I got left in this world because he had stage four lung cancer and stage four esophagus cancer. He said, I don't know how much time I have left in this world, but I'm not going to go to my grave knowing that I could have done better. You know, if he asks for help, he's getting help, whether he likes it or not. And, and I've kind of adopted that with, with the guys that I sponsor. And, and I want to be like him, man. I mean, he, he practiced this program like nobody else that I've ever seen practice this program. And I mean, I haven't seen a lot of people. I'm sure there's a lot of people that practice it just as good. But, you know, he, he was my shining star. He was my example. And his wife shared a couple of weeks ago at a convention and she was talking about, um, you know, people and what they're willing to settle for when they get come to Narcotics Anonymous. And she said, you know what, I'm tired of settling for the crumbs when I know that I can have the whole cake. Why wouldn't I go for the whole cake? You know, I'm worth the whole cake. I don't want the whole, just the crumbs. I want everything this program has to offer. And, and that's kind of where, where I've evolved to. Um, you know, I finally, I retired, like I got injured, had another neck surgery, and I survived the clean. I survived my mother dying clean. I survived my brother dying clean. I've been married three times, divorced twice in recovery. Well, actually, three. I've been married three times. I'm divorced three times in recovery, been married twice in recovery, but been married three times. Um, you know, I'm not a relationships expert by any means. I could probably tell you more on what not to do. But the thing is, Dutch used to always tell every one of our sponsees is the best way to judge somebody's recovery is by looking at their relationships. And not necessarily just sexual relationships, but their, their, how they get along with their coworkers, how they get along with their sponsor, how they get along with their sponsees, how, they, how do they get along with their neighbors, how do they get along with their friends, how do they get along with other addicts and just people in general. And, <clears throat> and I try to practice kindness. That's the one thing he instilled in us. It doesn't cost anything to be kind. 
And, and the results of being kind far outweigh the results of not being kind. And we didn't get claimed to be mean. Um, and if we have a wonderful relationship with a loving God, kindness just comes. It, 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 it comes, it, it, it just works its way into our system. And it's from the 12 steps. You know, it, it like when I, I retired, the doctors actually disabled me because I, I can't turn my neck but so far. And I was a, a delivery driver and I couldn't get, I couldn't turn my neck far enough to, to back a tractor trailer into a, into a loading dock so they wouldn't renew, renew my DOT and they disabled me. And um, I moved to Florida and I had two beautiful motorcycles. And, and I said, I'm moving to Florida and I'm going to decide which motorcycle I'm going to ride, which meeting and which new car I'm going to help. And I did it for like, I don't know, somewhere between six months and a year. And, I, and then my hand started to shake. And, and then my other hand started to shake. And I went to the doctor and I told him I thought I had Parkinson's because my grandfather had it. And he said, nah, it's from nerve damage from your two neck surgeries. And um, they started shaking even more. And then I started to drool and I started all, all this weird shit that I didn't know anything about. And I started to research Parkinson's. And I went back to the doctor and said, Doc, I hate to argue with you, but I think I got Parkinson's. And he sent me to a uh, neurologist, a movement specialist, and they told me I had Parkinson's. And I got very angry and I got angry at God. And I said, God, why would you do this to me? And I have a friend out in San Diego, his name is Ronnie G. And he's like the most spiritual guy I know. And I called him up and I was in tears and he said, Barry, get on a plane and come out of here. So I went on, got on a plane and went out there and he said, Barry, what was the worst thing that you ever diagnosed with your whole life? And I thought, well, was it the hep C? Um, no, was it, was it this, the, the um, the Parkinson's, I said, I don't know. And, and Ronnie said, it was probably when you realized that you were an addict, that you have a disease. The disease was uh, fatal, terminal, and and not gone anywhere. And he said, you, you probably thought of the idea of having to go to these church basements, which you said you hated uh, every day for the rest of your life. And that was probably the worst diagnosis he got. And look how it's changed your life. And he told me there's a line in the Living Clean book that says, oftentimes we receive presents, but we don't perceive them as gifts by the way that they're wrapped. And he said, that's what's gonna happen with the Parkinson's disease. He said, you can use it as an opportunity to get closer to God. You can use it as an opportunity to remove the roadblocks that keep you separated from your spirit you can remove the roadblocks that keep you separated from the steps. You can use this thing as the spirit of recovery and the spirit of everything you've learned in Narcotics Anonymous as a way to be a better human being, a more kind, more considerate, more sincere, more loving human being and help more people. It's up to you. Do you want to sit and stew in your shit? Or do you want to go on? And he said, maybe you can use it as a way to help another addict who's getting diagnosed right this minute and is worried about how's he going to tell his wife and kids? How's he going to tell his boss? Is he going to be able to keep his job? He said, look for ways to serve. He said, we, have, we don't get clean for no reason at all. He said, we get clean to serve. And that's our obligation. That's our 12th step. And so I started doing that. And then a year later, I went to the doctor and they told me I had cancer. And it's like, oh, not again. And I said, God, why are you doing this to me? And the answer I got once more was God, was, God isn't doing this to me. He's doing it for me. He's given me an opportunity to grow spiritually, to become a better, more rounded, more loving and caring and serving human being. And it's, it's changed my life. You know, um, I got rid of the cancer. I went through all the treatment. And it's 
and it's, you know, it sat me of energy and, you know, I'm tired all the time, but I'm just willing to serve and, and I'm, in my, I'm in an attitude of, I know that no matter what happens in my life, God's got me. In all the years that I've been doing this, I've never received more in any one day than I could handle. And that's been a promise to me. And that promise has been kept. And when I was in treatment, I remember I said, you know, these people from Narcotics Anonymous Hospitals and Institutions, the most wonderful people in the world, real enemy soldiers, they said tonight, when you're all alone in your little rack, if you really want to be clean, ask for help. And I'm like, well, who do you ask? And they said, ask God. And I said, I don't know if I believe in a God. They said, if you don't believe, just believe that we believe. They said, borrow our God. And I remember laying in the little rack and I said, God, I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you are. And I don't know if you are. But if you can help me, to find this new way to live, I'll do anything. And see, I had never had, the only contact I had had with God in the last 40 years was, God, please let this shit cook up. God, please let that dude come back with my money. God, please let my dad put up the house for bail. And this was big time Barry, once again, asking, trying to make a deal with this loving, wonderful power, saying, if you help me, I'll do this. And, you know, and I believe that God just laughed at me and said, you know what, I'm going to help you just because you're willing. And I said, if you can help me find this way of life, I'll do anything. And every time I do an H&I community or a prison or, or help another addict or share a meeting, I thank God you know what for? For choosing me to be of service. To give me an opportunity to share and to grow. To give me the opportunity to possibly help another human being. And I have a detox commitment that I love. It's on, on Tuesday nights. And, and I've had treatment. I've had jail. I've had every kind of commitment that H&I does. I've been doing it, it all together for over 30 years. And, and, I, and the reason I like detox is because I want first crack. I want to get them first before they're ruined by any other fellowship. I don't mean that in a, in a, in a nasty way. I just don't want them to be misinformed. Um, if they're an addict, I want them to know that they're an addict. And I want them to learn what, what the difference between um, different, different programs by people who have an understanding of, of what the difference is between us and others. Um, but anyway, so back to the story. Father Frank, um, when I started getting clean and I, I told him I wanted to be a poster child, he said, I want you to forget everything you know about all the step work you've ever done. And we're going to start all over with step one. And step one is to me nowadays, he told me he wants me every morning when I get up and look in the mirror, either to shave or brush my teeth, he wants me to say, Barry, has anything changed since yesterday as far as being an addict? And it's no, it hasn't. So what that tells me is I'm still powerless over my addiction. And my life is still unmanageable. That I can't con fix, manage, or control things. That, so what does that do? It leaves a, a void in my life. Step one identifies my problem. Simple and clear and plain. I'm an addict. I have a disease. And I'm a sick person looking to get better. Step two identifies the solution. It says we could be restored to sanity. Big word is could. It doesn't say will. It says could be. With that comes willingness and acceptance and open-mindedness and honesty and willingness to want to recover from this disease. But it tells us it's possible. We can be recovered. 
or recover till death, and then at that time we'll recover. But I want you know. So uh, the uh, the problem is identified, the solution is identified. In step three, we commit to the solution. This program has been written so simply, and we complicated so much. Like I was so fearful of those steps, seeing those steps on the wall. And if we really just pick them apart and 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 figure out what they really, the, the simplicity of the way they're really written, they're really simple. Um, and, and once I, I got over the fear of the simplicity of the steps, you know, they just, they're, they're a spiritual like um, path. And we just stay on the path from one to 12. And we do, you know, we have many spiritual awakenings. And for me, the big spiritual awakening and, and having done step 11 and then coming to step 12 is, I do have an understanding of the Narcotics Anonymous Program, and I know enough to help people recover. I know how to tell somebody to get a day clean. I know how to say, just stick with me, follow me, come with me, do what I do, do what we do. That's what that chapter, the chapter, what can I do, says everything in that chapter. It's to me like the most comprehensive chapter in the book as far as telling us how to stay clean. And... Um, I, 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 Jojo, I, I really appreciate you asking me. I hope I meet every one of you guys somewhere someday. Um, if chances are there's more of you than there are of me, I won't remember you guys, but maybe you'll see me somewhere. Please come up and, and say, hey, I met you, or I remember you from a Zoom meeting, and we'll go get a meal and break some bread and talk some shit and talk recovery and just, you know, love each other, you know, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Right Thank on. you, Barry. Barry, you're a true gift to Narcotics Anonymous.